Now, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts, our lives, this night. Because we know and recognize that the teacher of the church is not a man. We haven't come to hear from a man or a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, white man, black man, brown man. That's just so stupid, God. We have come and we're smart enough to know that when we walk into your house, Holy Spirit, you have us. Now touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And God, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We're all in agreement, and Father, as we say amen in a moment, but Lord, we want you to not only bless us, but to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight throughout this entire weekend. And God will give you the praise. And Father, in Jesus' mighty name, as you bless us, bless them. And we say with a great big shout, amen. amen. Some years back, I was teaching the church about finances. You know, financial things are very important. As you saw, you come on Sundays, you know that the Bible, not just preachers, but here's what's important. The Bible speaks about finances and how you manage them and how you deal with them and what you do with them. Because that has a lot to do with who you are and how you do life, is how you deal with what you have. Everything you have, God gives you, you know that. It all comes from God, but how you deal with it, what you do with what God, what God gives you is very important. And over the last couple of months, we have done some phenomenal teaching here on Sundays. Pastor Luke, Pastor Dan have done a great job in bringing the word of the Lord, teaching you what the Bible says and using examples from the Bible in people's lives in the Bible about how they dealt with things and how they didn't deal with things, how they got blessed and how they didn't get blessed and what Jesus thought and all of that. Just the fact that you find in scripture that God talks like 214 times about faith and 218 times about love or whatever, but he talks 2,000, I think it's 84 times in the New Testament about finances, about stewardship, about how you deal with life, because how you deal with things, material things, has a lot to do with where you're really at with God. And I found something out early as a pastor. I found out that you can teach a congregation what the Bible says about finances, but that will not cause them, most of them at least, to give anything more than they already have. Because until you go to the root of why people don't give, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to us, you haven't done your job. And I was asking so many times, as how many you know, times I've asked God, why is it that people don't give? And the same answer comes all the time to me. God said, look at yourself and look at Deborah when you were young. Now, I married Debbie when she was 27 years old. She didn't have a thing. I had a little bit, had a little business going. I was doing pretty good. And uh, when I married Debbie, she drove an old, old beat up car uh, that uh, it was horrible, had no brakes. When, when she had to stop in those days, she could reach down underneath the, the, the dashboard and pull this brake handle out and that would stop the car. And I thought, gosh, if I'm gonna marry this woman, I don't want her dead before I'm gonna marry her. So <laughs> I bought her, I didn't have that much money, but I, I found this old lady that had this big old giant Cadillac car. I, it was just a dump of a car, but the woman had it in the garage forever, never drove it, you know? And uh, I thought, well, I'll buy it for Debbie. So I gave her car away to somebody. Oh God, forgive me for that. And, um, and then, you know, and then I bought this giant old car f for Debbie and, it, and I don't know whatever happened to it. She sold it to somebody or whatever. It was just a piece of junk. And, um, but it was safe knowing the way Debbie drove, she needed a very big car around her. And to this day, my kids will agree that she absolutely needs uh, the bigger the car, the better. The other day she was looking at one of those those Arnold Schwarzenegger type uh, uh, vehicles. What do they call their, uh, like, 
Hummers. Oh, she says, that's what I need. I said, you need a Hummer with a snow plow in front. That's what you need. I mean, she deads up everything. She's really cute and, you know, it's okay and I don't mind. It's very girlish and I kind of like it, actually. It's kind of fun. But she had a problem with giving. I mean, she was a single mom raising a daughter, she working at a Bank of America, and she hadn't learned about giving. She would give, but she would give very reluctantly and very, very, you know, difficultly. She would give because she was prompted by the preacher to give. And, and um, we ended up giving, you know, as we felt like it. Instead of giving, there was something wrong. And what was wrong with us is the same thing that's wrong with 90% of people who don't give. Now, let me tell you about people who don't give. 12% of the people that attend this church give 65% of the bills of this church. They pay 65% of every expense of this church, 12%. That means 82% or 88% don't even touch the bills. So there's probably at least 80% of you out there that really want to give, would like to do what God says. You already know that God is watching you for that area of your life. But for some reason, you're not comfortable giving. And until we get to the root of the problem, no matter how many times they tell you that God wants to do this, show you in Scripture, give you all the Scriptures for it, tell you the stories, Old Testament, New Testament, tell you what people say, it isn't going to change you until we get to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is an interesting root. For us, it was a word called worry. We worried about everything. Deborah would worry, I would worry, we just worried. We didn't know how we were going to make it. Two plus two didn't make four. Uh, how is this going to happen? Oh yes, I, I believe that God's going to come through and supernaturally meet our needs. And I've heard about other people who've been blessed because they do this. But for me, I'm just in this place of not wanting to give because, you know, the real bottom line of it is I'm afraid. There's a fear that is translated here that stops my faith from giving. And it's called worry, and it's really bad. And throughout the scripture, God deals with this subject because until you personally deal with this area of your life, you're never going to be a giver, and you're never going to be a generous person that Pastor Dan talked about last week, and you're never going to be blessed like God wants to bless you. You're just going to always stay on the fringe of that. And you, you got to get past this area of worry. I worry whether or not God's going to come through. Oh, yes, praise God. I know he's going to come through, but, you know. And then I talk to some people, and the real spiritual ones say, well, I'm not worrying. I just have a concern. You know you're laughing because that's exactly where a lot of you are. I really don't worry. I'm just concerned, you know. But let me tell you about concern. There's a little formula that goes with this that keeps you from doing anything and stops your life in the area of blessing. Number one, it starts with concern. Everybody has the right to be concerned. When concern lasts too long, it turns into worry. And when worry lasts too long, it robs your faith. And when faith is robbed, you never end up doing anything, getting anything, or being anything. And that's why we're going to look at the profound words of Jesus and then underline these words. If you could just pop this up for us. And part number three, I guess it is, the war in worry. There is a war going on in your life that causes you to worry, you want to call it concern, <clears throat> but causes you flat, simple to worry. And worry will bring you to a place of inactivity and lack of ability and everything else. And God talks about it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Is anybody listening to me now? <clears throat> kind of a fun understanding of the things of God. I want to take you to Psalms 39. There's a really peculiar verse in Meditating these verses over the years, I, I, I think maybe of you one of those verses you'll read and not really understand, but I'm going to explain it to you if I can. In Psalms 39, when you're there, take a look and get your pen out, and let's take a look at verse number six. We're talking about the war and worry. 
And then we're going to go to the profound words of Jesus about what to do about worry. Because there's not only uh, recognizing the problem that's important, but it's also doing the right things to overcome the problem so it doesn't stand in the way keeping you from being blessed in the areas of your life. Is that okay? Are you following me at all? Is everybody listening at all? In this verse, verse number six of the 39th chapter of Psalms, it says, surely every man walks about like a shadow. Surely they busy themselves in vain. They heap up riches and does not know who will gather them. What he just described is a lot of our lives. You don't know this, but if you really translate what he's trying to say to you, is that every man walks about, and then it says, like a shadow. Like a shadow means the thoughts of your thinking. That in the thoughts of your thinking, every man walks around, does his thing, operates really in the thoughts of his own thinking. And when your thoughts are in your right place, you get blessed. If your thoughts are in the wrong place, and like worry, you'll find yourself absolutely messed up. In fact, he defines this, if you will. So the thoughts of our shadows is what we think about, whether it be good or bad. In this particular case, the word worry really jumps out at this verse. So every man walks about worrying in his thoughts, and surely they're busy themselves, and they're busy in this, but listen to the word, and it says, and it's in vain. They, they're, they're busy thinking, they're busy activity, they're busy, 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 but they're not getting anywhere, there's no activity. In fact, they make a lot of money, the next verse, come, next part of that verse comes along, but they're so worried about, they don't know how they're gonna collect it or add it. They don't know if people are gonna pay them. The money isn't the issue. The issue is now, past the money, they're worried about something. You know, so we used to be that worried about money, but now they don't worry about money anymore. Talk about, listen to this, who's gonna gather the money for them? They're always living in this vain world that never gets anything done. They never accomplish anything. You know why? Because they're stifled by the word worry. And that's what the verse is talking about. And most of us that are in this room, and I don't say this again, I want you to hear me. I don't want to be mean, I don't want to be ugly, but let's be honest with each other, at least before God. Most of us in this room worry. And you're going to have to learn how truly to live your life not worrying, because if you worry when you give, you defeat everything that you're giving and the purpose of your giving. And you're gonna to have to deal with this issue. It is an issue that comes from the garden. It's an issue that comes when Adam and Eve first fell. It is an issue in a human DNA that we're not sure about things, so we worry about things. And when we worry, remember what happens, it breeds what happens, unfaithfulness. So we have no faith, and faith stops us from going, doing, being what God would have us to go, do, and be. So everybody listen. Yeah. And so that's exactly what he's describing here. And I want to share some of it with you tonight as we look at the word of God. Let's go to the words of Jesus in Matthew 13th chapter. And remember last week, we, last time we were together, at least we were in Mark, uh, the word of God, the gospel of Mark on the same verse. But I want to read it to you out of Matthew, the 13th chapter. And let's take a look if you've got your Bibles, Matthew 13th chapter, verse number 22 talking about worry. Let's look at it again. And keep in mind, no matter who you are, most of you out there, oftentimes even me, have concerns that are lasting too long, becoming worry. Listen to this. Worry defeats my faith, and all of a sudden, I get nothing. So I'm going to have to deal with this word called worry. One man, I was talking to Mark Horan today, a friend of mine in Australia, a pastor in Australia, he called me uh, just before I left for church tonight. And he said, what are you going to minister on? Because I, I don't know if they live stream or whatever. And I, and I said, um, I'm going to minister on worry. And he said, worry to me is like sitting in a rocking chair. And I said, what do you mean? He says, there's movement, but you don't go anywhere. And I thought that is such a cool thing because that's what happens is that worry gets you going, but it's all in vain. And that's what that verse was saying. But here Jesus makes a statement. 
From even where we were talking last week, only it was described in Mark, now we're going to look at Matthew, in the, if you will, in the uh, 13th chapter, verse number 22. And he who receives seed, remember that seed is the word of God. Remember this from last time we talked together. And he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. So sometimes you'll hear the word, and so will I, but watch this. But then something happens, and the cares of this world, the cares of this world. Do you know what the cares of this world is? Worrying about where you're at, what you have, and how you're going to make it. That's what it means. The cares of this world. That means worrying. That's just what happens. He says, and the deceitful lust of riches. In other words, boy, I just work for riches. I work for riches. I work for riches. I'll be satisfied if I get the money. Believe me, you'll keep on worrying just as much after you get the money as you did before. We saw that in that verse just before this. And he says, it cloaks the word. And he becomes, and he becomes, what's the last two words? Unfruitful. Could everybody say the word unfruitful? unfruitful. One more time. Could you say it one, everybody, could you say it one more time? Unfruitful. And see, the war is to get you to worry so that you become unfruitful. Is, are you following me? So I can learn, here's what God wants for me. I can hear this is how God wants me to do it. I can hear this is what the Bible says. I can hear the story after story after story. But I'm still living in this world of concern that has gone now too long to worry. And worry is producing no faith. And guess what happens when I have no faith? I don't get anything. Does anybody listen? There's this couple sisters by name Mary Martha. A lot of people don't ever understand the story so much. It's kind of an interesting story. Jesus comes to visit their house, and Mary is like really taken by Jesus. And as Jesus talks, man, she is like sitting at his feet, gathering everything she can from Jesus. That should be the, our attitude. But Martha's different. Martha is the one laboring in the kitchen. She's the one setting the table. She's the one serving everybody, and she kind of gets bugged. And she goes to Jesus, and she says, Jesus, I'm doing all the work. My sister Mary is not doing anything. Tell her to help me. (laughs) And, you know, and in common sense, you and me, we would say, Mary, don't let your sister do everything. Help Martha. Go on, get up, get out of here, do what the women's supposed to do. And uh, that's what we'd probably say something like that. But Jesus had a completely different response. And I want you to look at it with me, if you will. Go with me to Luke, the 10th chapter. We're in Matthew, so go to, let's hold your place. Matthew, we're coming back there in just a minute because we're looking at the profound words of Jesus. But let's go to Luke in the 10th chapter. And let's look at Luke in the 10th chapter, right at the end, verse number 40. And listen to the story because it's really fascinating about worry. Is that Okay. I want you to get this because it's so interesting. But Martha was distracted with much service. And she approached him, notice the capital H on the word him, meaning Jesus, and said, Lord, do, not, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about your sister. Does it say that? No, No, it does not say, you are worried and troubled about your friends. Does it say that? No, it says, Jesus who knows the heart of Martha, and he says, you are worried and troubled about many things. She was a worrier. She probably would belong to the rock. And she was worried about these things. And Jesus makes this statement in verse number 42. But one thing is needed. And then there's something that's needed here. And he makes it very clear. And Mary has chosen that good part. In other words, Mary has chosen what is needed. And what is needed is she was sitting at my feet. And that's more important than you serving. And a lot of times we are so hard at work. We forget to sit at his feet 
And it's at his feet that we have to learn to trust because it's easy to put your effort and energy in what you do that brings results, but it's hard to put your faith in something that you don't see the results in. And therefore Martha's putting her faith in what she does and she becomes this worrier as you just saw. And But Mary has chosen the best part, which will not be taken away from her. I'll not tell her to go serve in the kitchen. More important than serving the people is sitting in my feet getting the word of God. And for all of us, <clears throat> we can become such worriers about what we do that we miss God completely. Is everybody listening to me? We become such worriers about what we do and how we do it, we miss God completely. Wow, fascinating. Now, with that in mind, I want to take you to the profound words of Jesus found, if you will, in um, this battle that goes on about worry in Matthew, the sixth chapter. Would you go there with me? In Matthew, the sixth chapter, um, let's take a look at this. I'm going to go fairly fast in Matthew, the sixth chapter. Now, here's the interesting part about this. Pastor Dan's brought this up. Pastor Luke's brought this up. And I want to bring it up also before this big weekend that's coming. Because, you know, the bottom line, you're not bringing anything. Some of you will. Most of you will not. You'll show up for the party. And that's cool. But until you deal with the root of the problem, you'll never bring anything. And that root is worry. And that's the situation. I'm just telling you the truth. I've been around a long time. I know you real well and love you like crazy. But also, after all these years, 40 years, I understand you. And I understand the Bible. And I understand where you're at. And it's okay, but it's not okay to stay there. You gotta get past the worry, and get into trusting God. Because it's in the trusting that you say, I'm going to bring God. And you got to, listen to this, this is the catch 22. You got to bring something without worrying about what you brought. Because <laughs> you defeat the whole purpose if you do that. And Debbie and I had to learn this the hard way. And so we were no different than any of you that are in here. And so it's so important for us to look at this Matthew, the sixth chapter, because it's about three things. It's about money. It's about stewardship. Can you imagine that? Jesus talking about such things. And it's about worry. I guess you can put a fourth thing in there. And it's about literally not doing anything. And so here's all that we're saying wrapped up in these verses right in front of our face. I mean, where do we talk about, stop thinking about this. Where do we talk about money in one verse and talk about stewardship in the next verse and then talk about worry in the very next verse? And why is it that way that he'll talk about money, stewardship, and the very next verse start off with worrying? Because that's where we're at. He, know, <laughs> he knows all of us really well. Until we deal with this issue, we will never be the blessed people that God wants us to be as far as economics. Yeah. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Now look, I don't care if you bring nothing Sunday. Learn the lesson. That's more important. Because with that lesson, your future is going to be <clears throat> fine right. and wonderful. Let's take a look at it. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Let's take a look uh, right back. Let's start verse number 19. Matthew, do not lay up for yourselves treasures. Let's take the word treasure of it in your Bible. You have a pen, circle it, and put valuable things or values, if you want to write that in there. You know, a lot of people have different treasures in their life. Some people have cars, man, they're, they're hung up on their cars. And some people have houses, and they're hung up on their house. That's their treasure. A lot of people nowadays in this generation is their kids are their like treasure. Their whole life is poured into their kids. I mean, I couldn't believe it. The other day I was asked to take the kids someplace. They want to know if I had car seat. Of course I don't have a car seat. What would I, who would I put in a car seat? Debbie? 
I mean, I, you know, we used to drive a little bit in our days without car seats. I remember when we didn't have seats, <laughs> let alone headrests. And uh, I remember when air conditioning used to blow ice against the back of your head. Yes, that's right. In our covered wagon, we had ice blowing out there. That's where some of you think I'm at, you know. <laughs> I didn't have a car seat, but guess what? A lot, a lot of people's treasures are in different things. Treasure could be in their looks. Treasure could be in their hair. Treasure could be in their skin. Treasure could be in their finances, their job, their education. I don't know, where is your treasure? I mean, you stop and really think about just that one word right there. Really, truly, come on, be honest. Don't give me this spiritual stuff and tell me Jesus. Because if it was, we wouldn't even be talking about this subject tonight. Is that all right? Do you still like me? Yeah. I like you. So let's get past the foolish stuff and the pat answers to everything. And let's get down to some reality in thinking all of us need to learn something tonight. We all have treasures on the inside of us. Some of us, it's our retirement program or, you know, I'm learning how that this church became my treasure. And how sad was that? You know, it was really hard for me to turn my treasure over to somebody else. And, and I had to walk away and I have to walk away. It's not that I had to walk away, I have to walk away, there's a difference. And I had to turn because then I had to find out, oh my goodness, my real treasure is not in this church, in the development of this church, my real treasure is him. Amen. You know, and I can get so caught up in my job and you can get so caught up in who you are and what you do and your cars and all your stuff in your houses and where you live and all that stuff that that becomes your treasure. Let's read it now with a little different insight. Do not lay up for yourself on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Man, that just says so much about the values of our life. Where your treasure Where your treasure is, that's really where your heart's at. If there's anything you see in the scripture, in the book of Matthew, is Jesus really training his disciples with bizarre commitment statements to make sure that their treasure is going to be the things of God and not themselves. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. Then he goes from there to verse 22, which is the most fascinating thing. He goes from this money, treasure, value, in your heart thing, to verse 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. Stop. The lamp of the body is the eye. The lamp which gives us light to see is the eye. The problem with it is, is spiritual people do not see with their eye. Their eye is their heart. And so the lamp that gives me light in my body that gives me clear path is what's in my heart. But we'll call it an eye because Jesus does. Because you don't see, because this would be terrible. He makes a statement like that and people are blind. They can't relate with this. So the, you don't see with your eyes. You see with your heart. And where you have your heart is where your treasure is. Isn't that what he said the verse before? And he comes along and says, now the lamp of the, uh, of the body is the eye. And if therefore, in other words, if what I just said, your eye is good. Now the word good means that of God. Not good like you think or what society or our social systems tell us. But good is what God says is good. None good but 
to try it again. None good, but. So when he makes a statement good, he's talking about what good is, what God says. So he says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye or the heart is good, then the whole body is full of light. Man, you're going to get blessed. Then he comes along and gives you an absolute change on this. And he comes along and makes this statement, verse number 23. But if the eye is bad, in other words, a heart is now fixed on something other than what is God. Worry. Concerns too long that have become worry that rob your faith. Oh, I got faith. I got faith. Yeah, but you're still worried. You don't have faith. Got to understand something. If you worry about something, you do not have the kind of faith that is going to change your world. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? And so he says, if the eye is bad, then the whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light is in you is dark, then how great is the darkness, man? How bad is your life going to be if your heart is not on the right things? Remember, he said, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. So where you place your values Talking about finances, talking about the heart, talking about the eye. Let's take a look, if you will, at verse number 24. No man can serve two masters. Here comes the money. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Very next verse. So if your eye is fixed on your worrying more than it is on the things of God, guess what? You're in darkness and your faith is not faith at all that'll get you to where you need to be. Because you can't serve both God and mammon. But if your eye is on things of God and you know that God's going to be the one that meets your needs like Mary. Mary didn't worry about setting the table. She knew that Jesus was the answer to her future. See, and when you get to the place where you know that Jesus is the answer to your future, money has nothing to hold you back. You're just going to have to do do what you got to do. And that and the root of the problem is defeated. So all of a sudden he goes really from these bizarre verses to right into the money. And then verse number 25 comes along and it says, therefore, you know, therefore is a funny word. It means because of what I just said in verse 24. Verse 25 says, therefore, I said to you, do not worry. Where did the worry come in? I thought we were talking about the heart. I thought we were talking about You know, where my treasure is, is my heart. I thought we were talking about you can't serve two masters. I thought we were talking about my eye. We're seeing the good things and I'll have good things ahead of me. And if it's bad, it'll be bad things. It'll be real darkness. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, here comes the next verse. Bang! It's not a mistake. He ties who you serve, what you see, and where your treasure is with whether or not you're in worry condition and in a worrying condition you'll never forget it you'll never give you until you deal with the issue like Debbie and I had to deal with it I taught and taught and taught and taught and taught congregations for 40 years all over the world until the congregation deals with this problem of worry You can forget about who you serve. You will serve mammon. And you're defeated because your whole body's dark and that's where your treasure is at. Is anybody listening? Profound words of Jesus. Therefore, because of what I just said, I say to you, do not worry about your life. When I got to the place in my life where I said, I don't give a flip. I don't give a flying, galloping ghost whether God comes through or doesn't come through because I know he will. That's not an issue for me. I could care less. I, to this day, became the biggest, largest giver of this church. 
I'm not saying it to brag. I'm saying it as a point of education for you. That a man in the pulpit who knows the principles of the word of God can become the largest giver in a church full of physicians, doctors, psychiatrists, attorneys, and everything else you can think of, a physicist, and the preacher becomes the biggest giver. Why? Because he dealt with this issue. And you know what I found out? That God's word is exactly what he said it was. The more I gave, the more he gave. And at first I had concerns, but I never let them turn into worry. And when you let your concerns, which is natural, turn into worry, you have now on the border of failure, unless you get rid of the worry. What you'll eat or what you'll drink about your body, what you put on, verse B, if you will. Is not life more than food and body and more than clothing? The answer to that is, of course, verse 26. Watch this. Look after the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor toil. They don't even work, is what he just said. Neither do they gather in their barns. Have you ever seen a bird build a barn and take a seed, put it in a, in a barn? I mean, if you have a bird that built a barn in your backyard and put seed in the barn, please capture the bird. You're a billionaire right off the bat. We'll, make, we'll get a zoo, uh, a bird zoo, and charge for people to come in. We'll all be rich. No bird builds a barn, yet the Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more val where your values are? Is where your heart's at when God's value's on you? Can you imagine such a thing? Verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to it? In other words, listen, you cannot add one thing to your life by worrying. Worrying just wears you out. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen, and you got to trust that God's going to take care of it because it's going to happen. And God never says nothing bad will happen. Of course things bad will happen. I remember one time, when Debbie and I were young, we literally had given everything we had away. We were living in a rental house in Lake Arrowhead. And I was building a project with my father. I had no money, none whatsoever. Luke wasn't born. I think Jesse was only a few months old. Kim was a few years old. Miranda was probably five or six years old, if that. And we, we didn't have any money. And I said to Debbie, I said, I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills this month. And I was in an office when a man walked in the office of the project that I was building. And he said to me, um, do you know who owns lot 14? And I said, and we all had to put our names down on the lot because we couldn't get financing if somebody wasn't going to buy it. So I put my name down to buy the lot. I didn't have the money to buy the lot, but I did it so I'd get the financing, which, by the way, I never needed anyway. And a guy walks in, and my name happened to be on lot 14. And he walks in, he's got this old beat-up car. I saw him park it out in front, smoke's piling out all over the place. He's as dirty as dirty can be. He had hair all over the place. I will never forget the man. He walks in, he says to me, he says, listen... Do you know who owns lot 14? And I said, well, I own lot 14. He says, I want to buy it. I said, wait a minute. I haven't built it yet. It's still just a lot. He says, I don't care. I want your name off, and I want to put my name on the board. I want to buy that lot, lot 14. And I will give you $5,000 right now on this spot, if you'll take your name off of lot 14 and put my name on lot 14. I said, what is your name? <laughs> True story. Mama heard that. Mama's right there. She's going. <laughs> and, and, and I, I wiped off my name on the chalkboard. I wrote his name in. That guy gave me a five thousand dollar envelope with five thousand dollars in the envelope cash 
He jumped in his car, turned it on, boom, blew out smoke everywhere. You could smell him as he went out. He stunk and needed a bath. I never saw the human being again as long as I lived. Lot 14 got built and sold to someone else. He never came around. Let me tell you something. That wasn't a human. That was an angel coming in and helping me in my time of need. Why? Because I wasn't worried. And when I'm not worried, I'm in faith. And when I'm in faith, God goes to work. You can't add one cubit. Verse number 28. I love this one. Watch this. Verse 28. And so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. And neither do they toil nor spin. In other words, they don't work at all. Verse 29. Verse 29. And yet... I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of them men. He he never looked as good as a lily. Verse 30. Verse number 30. And now if God closes the grass of the field today and tomorrow is is thrown into the ovens, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little... Oh, you of... Oh, you of little faith. In other words, your worry made your faith little. Verse number 31. Therefore, do not worry. I thought he was talking about little faith. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Verse 32. Listen to these words. For after these things the Gentiles seek. You see see the word seek, Gentiles seek? That means people without God, that's what they do. They go after all the stuff. The stuff is important, God. It's not that God didn't want to have the stuff. He wants you to have the stuff. He just, like Dan said last Sunday, he doesn't want the stuff to have you. And when the stuff has you, you worry. So if you want to know if you're stuffed, (laughs) you're worrying. That's all it is. Simple as that. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. My favorite verse in the Bible, verse 30, 30, 36, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and then all the stuff will be added on to you. But first comes God. Verse, verse 34, and it says this, therefore, back to the subject again, do not worry about tomorrow, tomorrow will worry about its own. In other words, wor- tomorrow will take care of itself. Why are you worried about that? Sufficient for today is its own trouble. Verse 35. Is there a verse 35? I don't know if there is. I don't think there is a verse 35. Well, at least I don't have it on there. Important for us to see the truth here. He goes all the whole spectrum of giving, where your heart's at, what are you focused in on. If you're not focused in on the right things, You'll live in darkness all of your life. You will never accomplish anything. What were the two words I had you shout out before? Does anybody remember? What was it? No, no, before. Does anybody remember what they were? Unfruitful. Became unfruitful. Remember that? In other words, that's the battle for your life. Is This is what it's all about, that you become unfruitful in everything. See, he wants to stop you from really having the victory because guess what? You're worried about everything and you're stopping yourself. Now you say, well, pastor, how do I get over this? How do I deal with this? You have to deal with it the same way all the rest of us did. And can I take you to the verses? Please go with me to um, James first chapter. And let me just pop it up and over here because I'm out of time. In James first chapter, it says this, but let him ask in faith, With no doubting. Man, you can't worry when you doubt. If you're worrying, you're doubting. Let me say it again. If you're worrying, you're doubting. The proof of your faith is your rest. And if you're worrying, you're doubting. Let him, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the waves of the sea driven and tossed by the winds. Verse number seven, go ahead. And let not a man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Wait a minute. What were those two words again? Becoming unfruitful. Let let him think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. I don't know if they have verse 8 or not. Hopefully verse 8. 
He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. One moment he says, I got faith, the next moment he's in worry. So you say, well, how do I do this? How do I get out of this? That is exactly where I'm at. I, I would give, but then I'd worry about what I gave and, and worry about not having enough to make it. How do I do this? Simple. Every time concern comes, starts to multiply into worry that'll destroy your faith, you've got to do something found in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. In verse number six, it says it like this, therefore humble yourself. In other words, you're going to have to submit to God. Under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7, watch this. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Debbie, I don't know how we're going to make it. We don't have any money, but I know God's going to see that it gets done. And sure enough, some guy walks through and hands me $5,000. $5,000, my friends, in those days is probably like $100,000 today. And a man made 600 bucks a month in those days and lived like a king. And now is like $100,000. And so these are very important. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Every time concern starts to go to worry, you got to give it to God. You want to know how to win? Every time concern goes to worry, you have to give it to God. The concern is natural. The worry is ungodly. And the concern that's natural will turn into worry if the concern is let around too long and you don't get rid of it right away by casting your cares on he that careth. You've got to give it to God. Give it to God. This is not my fight. I did what I was told. This is yours. I'm not into this. I'm not going to, I'm casting down those thoughts. I'm keeping my eye on you. Therefore, I have a light in my life. Oh, and great is my reward. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting that he ties it all together, worry, giving, Worry, giving, worry, giving, all in all those sentences. My friends, the root of every one of your problems is you're a worrier. And until you learn, and so was I, to cast the care, if I had to, every hour of every day until I stopped caring because I knew he had it, I didn't have to take it back. I was never going to be the giver God wanted me to be. If God spoke to you tonight, I'm finished. Come on, tell him. Isn't that good? Powerful verses. Debbie says, I don't want you to go any more than 30 minutes. Okay. I was happy when she said she was staying home. I got something to say from God. It might take more than 30 minutes, so that's the way it is. Too bad. You know, everybody loves you when you preach 30 minutes, you know what I mean? My mother used to come to church. She said, you're going to preach short? I said, oh, shut up, Mom. I'm preaching what God wants me to preach, whether it's short or not short. She said, well, I just think everybody likes it better when you preach short. I hope she made it. <laughs> no, nah, she did. She did. She's great. She's a great lady. I just played with you. She's a great lady. Don't criticize me for going too long. I got something to say from God, and I'm not compromising. Too bad. All right, look. You know it's true. I've been truthful with you all night long. Let's also be truthful about this for the last five minutes. Some of you are going to die, go to hell. That's it, period. Okay, let's dismiss the church. No, you can change that. You know what changes that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. Watch what I'm going to say. Everybody in this room knows who Jesus is right here and believes him. You celebrate him at Easter, you celebrate him at Christmas, you think of yourself as a Christian. The problem with that is you cannot think your way into heaven. This is not whoever's the most positive thinker, ah, I arrived in heaven. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. 
Jesus tells us how to get to heaven in John the third chapter. You must be born again. Anybody tells you anything different than that is a liar. And that's what the Bible says, you must be born again. Here's the problem. Most people in American churches don't really know what born again means. So when he makes his statement, you must be born again, then he explains it to Nicodemus, who he's talking to, but they haven't figured that part out. So they really don't know what born again means. But I'm gonna tell you what born again means, just kind of speed the whole process up from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible, end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. You means you've given God all of your life. Listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing. Always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches. It's always been all or nothing. But we've watered that down. And I'll prove it to you by the last book in the Bible, a book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking and he says these profound words. I'm coming again and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What a crude, rude statement. We're always waiting for Jesus to say some little sweet, kind thing. That's in your face, man. He is in your face telling you like it is. I'm gonna vomit you from my mouth. You're not gonna be able to stay. Why? Because you're lukewarm. So let's define for you. What's lukewarm? Little what, lukewarm. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God. No, no, no. But you're not wholehearted for God. You know who he is in your head, but you haven't given him all of your heart. That's lukewarm. And when the time comes that it could be tonight that Jesus came, when you least expect it, he says, I will come. He says these words, he says, will I find faith? Will you be in faith when he comes? So I'm gonna tell you something right now. Some of you, if he comes tonight, if you don't listen to me, you're going to hell. And you can say, hey, I went to church and listened to that big mouth old preacher all night long. And he, you know, and I really enjoyed it and it was great and I got something out of it. And you'll still go to hell because you're going to go to hell because you come to church. Listen to me. You go to heaven. You go to heaven because you give him all of your heart and you got to give it to him all of your life. It's your call, your choice. He's not gonna flow around a cosmic cloud with a two by four, make you hit you in the head and make you do this. It's your free will choice to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. No other way, no other way. And tonight, here we are in this safe friend place. We've laughed, we've sung songs, we've clapped. You were great listening to the word of God tonight. I mean, you were great. What good is that if you go home and you die and you go to hell? Let's get right with God in this safe, friendly place. You say, Pastor, well, how do I do that? How do I get right with God? Let's don't do it my way. Let's don't do it your way. Let's don't do it some well-meaning church committee, you know, way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In other words, in a moment, I'm going to count to three. It'll sound like this. One two, three, and then I'm gonna pop my hands together. Bang, when you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is you're saying, pastor, I don't wanna go to hell. I wanna go to heaven. I wanna give him all of my heart and give him all of my life. I wanna be born again like Jesus said. And may I say this to you? And he says these words, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. That's why you have to raise your hand. Listen to this. He says, I'll confess you as mine when it comes time when you're standing before the Father. Tonight is your night of salvation. Please do not raise your hand if you're gonna play games with God. But if you're serious and you wanna give God all your heart, we'll help you, we'll love you, we'll fight for you, we'll work with you, we'll encourage you, we'll be there for you. There's a powerful, strong, healthy church behind you to get you where you need to go. But you're gonna to have to make the first step of wanting to do it, because I can't make you do it. Now remember, tonight is your night of salvation. Sit there and do nothing. 
And you made your choice before God because God just told you the truth. Or get your hand up and get right with God. I don't care if you've been to seminary. I don't care if you've been a pastor for years. Doesn't make one bit of difference. You can do this job without being born again. And tonight is your night to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. Tonight is your night to be born again. Headed for heaven and not in your presence in hell. Who should raise their hand when I raise? We'll count to three. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure. Now listen, you say, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep, you will be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a, in a safe place like this than it is to go to hell. And then you'll raise anything you can to get out of hell. But guess what? You can't get out once you're there. Tonight, tonight, tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. I've told you the truth. Pop my hands together. And it's your call. Your call. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. God bless you. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's three back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one. I think I already counted them. I already counted them. There's three. Anybody else? Real quick. Wave at me. I know there's more. There's four. God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? There's five. There's one right here. I got you. Your hands are so low. I got you back here. Six. I think I already got you. I might have counted you again, but I love numbers. I'll count you. Six, seven. Thank you. Anybody else? What? what? No, all, 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 no, all the sinners on this side. Nobody on this side, right? Oh, okay. God bless you. Seven, eight. Back over here. Where, where's number nine? Nine back there. God bless you. Where are you? Number 10 somewhere. Ah, I got you, sir. Right back there. Good man. Good man. 10. There's 10 wise people. Wise, 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 smart, smart, smart. <clears throat> we want to be counted in the wise and smart. Get your hand up. Anybody else? You know you need to. Get it up. Who cares what anybody says? Your call. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 10 wise people. Anybody else? There's 11. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 white people. Here's what I want you to do, all 11 of you. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, I want you to bring a friend if you need to bring a friend. Get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Nobody leave. I'll let you go in a minute. Let's encourage the people to come forward. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. Now listen, if you're serious about God, grab a friend, grab your stuff. If you're sitting next to somebody, that raise your hand, nudge them and say, come on, I'll go with you. I want you to get out of your seat in a minute and meet me right here in front. Let's all stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. <laughs> come on, home. Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. You raise your hand. Get down here. God, there's some of you that raise your hand didn't come, but you need to. So hopefully you'll come back and do that because you don't get saved by raising your hands. All of you in front, best call of your life. I promise you, the best thing you ever did. And I'm telling you, you, you ought to put a smile on your face. You're going to love it. See this guy over here, this handsome man? He is Dr. Becker. We call him Dr. B. And Dr. Becker's a cool guy. He's going to lead you in a prayer, give you some free stuff. No weird stuff goes on, I promise. Tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're the cool people behind you. They'll meet you before church service, buy you steak, lobster, Chinese food, whatever you want. And um, just to get you back to church, tell you about some great things and encourage you in the future. You need godly friends. That's what this is all about. Is that okay? We're here for you. So make a left turn. Follow Dr. Becker right over there. The people you came with, they'll wait for you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.